Hello and welcome to The Take with Sophie Ridge, live at nine, right here in the heart of Westminster. And there is one thing that everyone is talking about in Parliament today. Who is the MP accused of watching pornography inside the chamber? Well, the Chief Whip is investigating and Number 10 say it's wholly unacceptable. And with local elections just around the corner, Prime Minister's questions was as heated as ever. And if that wasn't enough, the High Court has today ruled the government acted unlawfully over care homes during the COVID pandemic. So there is lots to get stuck into today as we bring you takes from all sides over the next 60 minutes. 56 members of this House are under investigation for sexual misconduct, and that includes three of his Cabinet Ministers. Lots of claims of sexism, inappropriate behaviour and misogyny. We are going to be discussing those. This guy is doomed to be a permanent spectator, Mr Speaker. He's an ostrich, perfectly happy, keeping his head in the sand. And we'll bring you the best bits from another feisty Prime Minister's questions. Plus, who better to ask about it all than the most important people? That is you at home. We're going to see what our viewers make of it all. Here they are. Say hello, everyone. Hello. Bit of a wave. We're going to be hearing from our viewers panel uh, later on in the programme. And we'll also have some top guests, including the Home Office Minister, Rachel McLean, Labour's Shadow Chief Secretary to the Treasury, Pat McFadden, and we'll be speaking to Daisy Cooper from the Lib Dems. Much more besides. That's all on The Take. Hello, this is The Take, where we discuss the biggest stories, have a look at Prime Minister's questions and, of course, get reaction from politi politicians, analysis from my Sky News colleagues and, most importantly, the thoughts of our very own viewers' panel. Well, after the sexism storm that was sparked by coverage of Angela Rayner daring to cross and uncross her legs while sitting down, we now know the Conservative Chief Whip is investigating reports of an MP watching porn inside the chamber. Yeah, you really did hear that right. When minds did turn to the real business of the day, Boris Johnson and Keir Starmer pulled no punches when clashing over the cost of living in PMQs. And there were also questions over the High Court ruling that the government acted unlawfully over care home residents during COVID. So let's crack on. Here are some of the best bits of the week so far. This is the, the ruling from the High Court. Government policies on discharging patients from hospital to care homes at the outset of the pandemic were unlawful. I express my sympathy to the right honourable member for Ashton the Line for the subject to this type of comment in being demeaning, offensive to women in Parliament. You know, if we ever find who is responsible for it, we'll, well, I don't know what we'll do with them, but we'll be the terrors of the earth. 56 members of this House are under investigation for sexual misconduct, and that includes three of his cabinet ministers. I hope he's also sent a clear message that there's no place for sexism and misogyny or looking down on people because of where they come from yeah, yeah, yeah. in his party. And I, I repeat what I said to her, there could be absolutely no place uh, for such uh, behaviour or such uh, expression in this House. Our growth is set to be slower than every G20 country except one, Russia that the UK came out of COVID uh, faster than anybody else. That's why we had the fastest growth in the G7 last year. That would not have happened, Mr Speaker, if we'd listened uh, to Captain Hindsight. This must be the Oxford Union debating skills we've been hearing so much about. He's an ostrich, perfectly happy, keeping his head in the sand. Does he think that his 15th tax rise has made things better or worse for working people? What we're doing is making things better for working people uh, than his plans would do by a mile. I can tell the right honourable gentleman, I listened to him over many weeks, over many years, uh, this guy is doomed to be a permanent spectator, Mr Speaker. Uh, because everywhere you look at Labour administration, it is a bankrupt shambles. A vote for Labour next week is a vote for a very different set of persons. That's the difference between Labour and Conservative across the country, Mr Speaker. Vote Conservative on the 5th of May. You 
can really tell those local elections are approaching, can't you? Well, they were the best bits of the week so far in Westminster, but what does the country make of it all? We can try and find out, because now we are joined by our regular panel uh, of uh, viewers. Great to see you all. Uh, thank you very much for being on the programme with us uh, this evening. Uh, we've got people from across the United Kingdom and also across the political spectrum to try and take the temperature of how politicians are landing their points. And guys, I wanted to start off by talking to you about the High Court ruling on care homes. A really important story, this. Uh, this, of course, is at the beginning of the pandemic when people were being discharged from hospital without a COVID test and then, of course, uh, moved to care homes, which seeded uh, the, uh, the, the strain, the COVID-19 uh, in many care homes. So let's try and find out what our viewers panel uh, make of that. Are the government to blame? I think we can go first to uh, Ian Mucklejohn. Let's bring you in first, uh, shall we? Now, you are a Labour supporter, important to say, uh, Ian, not the biggest fan of Boris Johnson. What do you make uh, of this story on uh, care homes? Do you blame the government for um, seeding it within care homes? I think I blame the government for uh, using fine words that don't really have very much meaning. Uh, protected ring. Uh, what sort of ring was it? it? It sounds great, but there wasn't any protection. So the language didn't mean anything. Uh, yeah, they did, as you say. They promised to put that protective ring around care homes and, of course, with tragic consequences, uh, many uh, lost their lives. Um, let's bring Chloe in now, shall we, just to see uh, if Chloe agrees with some of those points that Ian was just making. Um, Chloe Forrest, uh, you're a Conservative supporter. Um, you were a nurse during the pandemic, weren't you? So I'm in interested to find your own view on this. Um, what's your experience of whether people were being discharged from hospital into care homes? And do you think the government uh, is to blame for making those mistakes? Thanks. I think that accountability needs to be taken across the board. So from care homes to the hospitals to any care um, providers, alongside public health, England and also the government. I think the government have made the, pro they've made the issue by promising things before they had the means to do that, such as offering those tests before um, they had the means to do it. However, is it not the responsibility of care home staff for accepting patients, knowing very well that they haven't had a COVID test? Um, is it the responsibility of Public Health England to fully inform the government of what's going on? You know, this was at the beginning of the pandemic where nobody knew anything that was going on. We didn't know how the virus worked, how it mutated. And every time they worked something out, it changed. So we didn't fully know what was going on. And I think that accountability should be taken across the board. I don't think it should be one person, or one, one group of people that is, you know, responsible for that. And I think looking into that, I've seen patients that have come from care homes that have, have not, you know, been tested for COVID and brought COVID into hospitals, you know, affecting hundreds and hundreds of people. That must have been so difficult for you, seeing um, those people with COVID-19, you know, into hospitals, into care homes. What, what was it like in just a few words, briefly, working as a nurse at that time? It was absolutely, it was heartbreaking. You know, and we did, I sat there and, and held the hands of those people that couldn't have any, anyone with them at the time. And it was heartbreaking, but at the same time, you've got to keep other people safe as well. You know, keeping those families out sometimes has also prevented it being spread around the families, you know, into playgrounds, to the grandparents, and I, I do this. The, you know, the ring of protection. It, it didn't happen, didn't it? Did it? But it also didn't happen in many other areas. For the example, hospitals. That you know, they didn't get any. We had to accept every patient through that door. COVID, no COVID, for a, and a lot from care homes that they never told us they had COVID when they did. Uh, thank you for sharing your uh, experiences uh, of, of that work. Let's bring in uh, Lucy, shall we? Uh, Lucy Atala, who uh, you're in based in Swansea, you're, you're a Labour supporter. What's your take on how uh, care home residents were treated? Um, well, if, if I want to talk specifically about moving them out of hospitals um, and back into care homes, then I, and if I want to lay blame, I lay blame directly on the government because they made the decision. They made the directive and they're in charge. And whoever's in charge and makes the decision is the person who's to, uh, or are the people to blame. So I don't think you can blame it on circumstance or we didn't know. 
you know, they, they did it. They made that decision. They didn't make another decision. They made that one. And that was the one that caused the virus to run through the care homes in the way that it did. And, and, and so they have to take responsibility for their actions. We all do as grown-ups. <laughs> and they need to, more than anybody okay. else in this case, it's not an excuse to say, well, we didn't know what the virus would do. Yeah, and asymptomatic um, uh, cases wasn't something that we knew about. Well, that's what Boris said today in, in question time. And, well, I thought to myself, okay. well, hold Thank on. You. There are so many illnesses that are asymptomatically spread. OK, thank you so that. much. Thank you so much, uh, Lucy, for your uh, thoughts on that. It's fascinating to hear what everyone uh, has had to say. Lots of divided opinion. Let's bring in Rob now, shall we? This is Rob Tyler, a Conservative supporter. Your wife, uh, I think I'm right in saying, is it worked in care homes. Do you think the government is to blame? I don't think the government's to blame, um, to be honest. I think care homes were expected to be able to work with infection control. And I think that the the care homes themselves were inconsistent in their care and in their work. And the staff, many were unvaccinated, so we saw a lot of um, people being infected, possibly by the staff that were looking after them. Um, so I don't think we can look specifically at the government. I think there was a case-by-case -case situation. There's even situations where some patients are inclined to wander, and it's very difficult to control where those people are going in the night sometimes. OK, thank you so much for uh, your thoughts. It's really fascinating uh, to hear and also lots of people with real experience uh, about what happened in care homes as well. If I didn't get you this time, we're going to talk to you later in the programme, so uh, don't worry. Uh, fascinating to hear what you all had to say. Well, uh, next, uh, it is time now to uh, talk to our first uh, guest. Uh, we'll talk to the panel uh, later on in the programme. Uh, I can now uh, introduce uh, Rachel McLean. Thank you very much for coming in uh, to talk Hi. to us this evening. Uh, she is the government's uh, safeguarding uh, minister. Firstly, on care homes. I think one of our panellists probably put it best. Uh, that was um, when we spoke to Ian Mucklejohn. He said that the government promised to put a protective ring around care homes. Mm. You didn't. Should you be apologising to people? So, obviously, it's, it's awful to hear this, those stories. And, of, of course, we are really sorry to hear of, of the losses of people. And I've heard those stories from my own constituents and, actually, my own mother's been in a care home. So I've got some lived experience of this and it was very difficult for everybody. So, look, there's been the judgment today and I think the government's been very clear that... Are you sorry? That that's, the, all, that's what people of course want to I'm hear. Sorry on a, on a, of course I'm sorry for those desperate losses that, that occurred and how, how could I, I not be? I'm sorry for any loss of life. I think it's right that the government is doing an inquiry. We'll look at, we'll look at all of it. But I think as some of your... Um, I just heard the last mm -hmm. section of your, your panellists and I think it, it's, it's clear, obviously, that we did, we, we did do what we believe was right at the time. We were following that clinical advice and it, it's an entire, it was an entirely new pandemic that I, nobody had I just want to come any in experience here, with. Because I think lots of people would give you a lot of sympathy for the beginning of the pandemic when we didn't know about asymptomatic mm. transmission. But I'm just going to read you the government guidance for care homes in September 2020. Mm. Remember, the judges in the trial were saying that there was growing awareness of asymptomatic transmission as early as March 2020. So this is September. Mm. A small number of people may be discharged from hospital within the 14-day period from the onset of COVID-19 symptoms, needing ongoing social care. They will have been COVID-19 tested and have confirmed COVID-positive status. So as late as September, when we knew about asymp asymptomatic transmission, people were still being discharged from hospitals into care homes. So I just, I just, I'm not sure I really buy this argument that, oh, it's at the beginning of the pandemic, we didn't know. It, it was going on for many, many months. I think the point is that we were following the advice of the, the clinicians and the medical advisors all, all the way through. And clearly decisions were made in a very fast-moving situation. Now, we need to look at what went wrong there. Of course we do, and that's why we're having the inquiry. But I think the judgment, um, and forgive me, I haven't had time to study it in detail because it has only just come out today, but I think it did recognise, actually, that we did do many of the things right and the vast majority of our response actually was, you know, it was they found in favour of what the government was doing in terms of prioritising testing and PPE for care home residents. So I think if you look across the whole response, obviously we were trying to keep people safe across the whole country and it was a very fast-moving and evolving pandemic as we went through it. Mm -hmm. 
Um, the Cabinet, of course, another big uh, story uh, at the minute in politics is the cost of living. Mm. Uh, brought up at Prime Minister's questions, lots of our viewers be very worried about it. Now, the Cabinet was asked to come up with ideas to ease the cost of living crisis this week, mm. but you couldn't spend any money, could you? It's a bit laughable. Well, I think we've spent billions and, and people know that. We've, we've put lots and lots of different support measures in place to help people with the cost of living, whether it's council tax rebates or whether it's help with their energy bills. And again, I know from my own constituency that there's a number of specialist and, and specific funds that are available to different households depending on their circumstances. So it is right that we help protect people, but I think we need to remember this is a global situation. It's been caused by the war in Ukraine, a number of other factors. It hasn't just been caused by the... I mean, cost of living was going up, inflation was going up before the war in Ukraine. It? Yeah, there's a number of global factors, obviously, the pandemic, the global situation, energy prices. A lot of these are outside the government's control. And, of course, it's right that we protect people, but at the same time, we have to remember that we can't possibly protect people from every single adverse circumstance that's going to come their way. It is right that we put our help towards the most vulnerable families, and that's, by and large, what we've been doing. Is it? Yeah, absolutely. The, the funding that we've got, um, and don't forget, we've got our plan for jobs. What we're trying to do is get more people. Is, it, is, it, what, is, is that really true that you're, put, you're prioritising the most vulnerable? Of course it is. Of course it is. We're doing that through our benefit system. You're we're doing, doing it through the benefit system. We're doing it, and also the rising. No, hang on. Sorry, the, the uh, rising universal credit is about half of what the so we're, inflation. We're, we're doing it through the benefit system, but also we're doing it through the rise in the national living wage. Just we're, do, we're doing, how you're it, doing it, through it through the, the benefit system. Well, we're doing it through our plan for jobs and getting more people back into work. That's why we've got more people in work than ever before, certainly since before the pandemic, because the best way to help people is actually get them out of the benefit system and into high-paying jobs. Can you just so that's what we are doing it through the benefit system. Because I, I, my understanding is that's not what's happening. Well, no, it is because we've got a comprehensive benefit system which has got universal credit and a number of other so elements. What's universal which... credit going up by? So universal credit is targeted at the most vulnerable people, um, and of course, also we have rise in the it's national. Going up living... by three point, is it three point seven percent? I believe, and inflation is set to peak at eight percent. Yeah, because that's just one element, as I said, of the support package which includes specific helpful council tax for a whole load of other costs that people will be incurring so okay. overall across the piece what we're doing is helping people with the impacts on their on their pockets and their household budgets okay and um, now the chief whip is investigating mm. uh, a conservative yes. MP reports that he was watching pornography on his phone in the House of Commons I mean this is actually quite unbelievable yeah. uh, what, what, what's your reaction to this I mean as yours is it's just gruesome None of us could believe our ears when we, we heard of this allegation. Um, and we all spoke to the Chief Whip immediately and he said he's going to take action. So you uh, spoke to the Chief Whip? Yes, I was there at the meeting. And what was said? Uh, we were just all shocked and horrified. I mean, how, how could it get any worse than that? I mean, you're in the House of Parliament and you're supposed to be legislating. And I'm the minister that's responsible for safeguarding women and for creating laws that protect women against sexual harassment and violence against women and girls. So it's deeply sickening and disgusting to hear that a male MP is watching porn. What should be done um, when that person is found, or, or I guess the, the name is already known? I don't know the name, but the Chief Whip, of course, is going to... Of course, he's investigating it already. He's already said that. He said that as soon as the allegation was made. Uh, action needs to be taken. I very much hope that this person will be... We'll see him out of Parliament, out of the party. So you think that he'll be out... At, you'd like to see him out of Parliament? I, I would hope that's where we get to. But, I mean, of course, we have to hear the full facts of the case. We've only heard one side of the story, but that's already, that's already starting to happen. But I just want to be clear, it's completely and utterly shocking and un unacceptable. But you think that he should be uh, out of Parliament and also, I guess, uh, out of the Conservative Party as well? Oh, God, th 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 there's no place for this in our party. Mm -hmm. Um, it obviously comes after the Mail on Sunday uh, front page, or not, not front page, I think it was inside the paper, wasn't it? Um, we mm. should hopefully be able to see it uh, on the screens just to remind viewers if, if they don't remember it. But this is effectively Andrew Rayner, deputy leader of the Labour Party, mm. uh, the story about her using a basic, in, a basic instinct of uh, uh, tactics to effectively distract Boris Johnson at Prime Minister's questions. I mean, it's pretty sexist stuff, isn't it? It's, it's deeply sexist. It's and deeply it's, sexist. It's come from... It sounds like the source of the story were MPs, again, Conservative MPs. Yeah, and again, you know, I don't know the source of the story. It's been reported in the papers. 
it's deeply sexist, it's unacceptable, and all of us get it all the time. We get it in public life, we get it in Parliament, it, it exists on all sides of the House. Uh, it's completely wrong, and I think, obviously, the Prime Minister's right when he said it has no place in our politics. And, again, I understand the Chief Whip is taking action. We need to find out who said these things. When you say that we've all had it, we've, what, what do you mean by that? What, what kind of... What have you all had? What, well, we, what all get, had? we all get derogatory comments about our appearance, about the things that we say. Any, any woman in public life will get it. I'm sure you probably get it as well. It, it's a common experience that we get. What I would like is to get away from that and to actually focus on what we're doing, the policies that we're enacting, mm -hmm. the really good things that we are doing for the women in this country that I'm actually very proud to be doing. And I think it's a shame that I'm having to come here talking to you and actually using up valuable time <laughs> when I could be talking about the amazing response to domestic abuse. Mm -hmm. That's what makes me the most angry, actually. Mm -hmm. I, I can... I do sort of get that. And mm -hmm. it does feel, doesn't it, that these kind of stories come up every once in a while, we talk about them and then they kind of fade into the background. Yeah, yeah. It, 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 does Westminster, do you think, have a particular sexism problem? I mean, look, we're 650 people, aren't we? So if you take 650 members of the public, would you find sexist attitudes? Almost certainly. We're in the spotlight. We are expected to be, to be possibly held to a higher standard, I think rightly so. Uh, I find it completely... I just find it disgusting and I just can't see how it can get any any worse than that. Mm. And it's just so frustrating because I came into politics to do good things. I came into politics to do good things for women, not to have to come onto programmes like this and talk about sexism and misogyny and all that kind of disgusting stuff that belongs in the gutter. Mm -hmm. No, that makes a lot of sense. And um, thank you so much for coming on and speaking so, like, forcefully about mm -hmm. um, some of these issues around women in Parliament. Pleasure. Thank you, uh, Rachel McLean, uh, there. Now, a bit later on, we'll get Labour's take uh, on all of that. Uh, but now we can uh, try and get uh, the take of our Deputy Political Editor, uh, Sam Coates, who joins us now. Um, Sam, we're just talking there with Rachel McLean about the sort of sexism uh, in Parliament, and it does feel like this is all everyone is talking about in Westminster at the minute, doesn't it? It does. We are a week away from local elections, but this has dominated for the last few days. There are a number of stories that are having quite a big impact at the moment. You mentioned the care home mm -hmm. uh, thing. Rachel also talked about that. It's interesting just going through what Rachel said. Rachel told you that she hadn't had time to read the judgment that came out today on uh, care homes from the High Court. Uh, it's actually only three pages, the summary, so it uh, took me about three minutes, but she doesn't appear to have had time to do that. Um, she said uh, that she uh, that at all times the government uh, were following the advice of the clinicians. Of course, the point that the High Court were making was that Patrick Vallance was saying on the radio, so the chief scientific advisor was saying on the radio that there might be asymptomatic transmission at the same time that they were sending old people back from uh, older people back from hospitals uh, to care homes. Uh, so I think these kinds of judgments by the court co uh, trigger big problems uh, for uh, politicians, but ultimately political verdicts. Uh, thank you very much for uh, fact-checking uh, some of uh, the interviews. Good to talk to you. We'll talk to you later on. Lots to cover this evening. So let's get Labour's take uh, now, because we're joined by the party's Shadow Chief Secretary to the Treasury, that is Pat McFadden. Thank you very much for being uh, with us. Uh, we are just talking there about uh, the care home story uh, with uh, Sam Coates. Um, the government, um, we heard there from Rachel McLean saying, that, you look, it was a fast-moving situation and they were following the advice of the clinicians. And actually, some of our viewers seem to have a bit of sympathy with that argument. Do you? Well, the verdict stands for itself, that it was judged to be illegal, but from what I've heard of the reaction to the verdict, it seems to be based on how could we know we didn't know about asymptomatic transmission. And uh, the truth is, even before the pandemic really took its biggest grip, there was a lot of talk about this. There were articles in The Lancet. There was the interview from Patrick Valance that we've heard of. There was, in fact, discussion of asymptomatic transmission as far back as January, two months before the lockdown, when we were just learning about COVID. So I think it's part of a broader problem with what happened in care homes. I mean, I remember writing to the Prime Minister uh, at the end of March 2020, after he promised my colleague Peter Kyle that care homes would have all the PPE they would need by the end of the week. And it was months before they had the PPE that they needed. So it's not just the release from hospitals, it was the fact that the care home system was left to fight this. And it, it really, in many ways, was hung out to dry. Okay. 
Um, I'm keen to talk a bit about the sexism uh, story, the storm, if you like, that is kind of engulfing uh, Westminster at the minute. Um, Rachel McLean just said that whoever the MP is, they shouldn't be in Parliament anymore, uh, the person who is expect uh, allegedly watching pornography in the chamber. Do you agree with that? Should they be kicked out of Parliament? Yeah, I do. I think, um, I think it's a really depressing story and it also comes after a number of other stories. We've had the story in the Sunday papers that over 50 MPs have been referred to uh, the independent watchdog. You've had the Angela Rayner story in recent days and uh, all of this is out of time and uh, women in politics today, women in journalism today are not going to put up with the kind of language and behaviour that might have been common decades ago. Mm -hmm. Times have changed. Broadly on this front, I think in society they've changed for the better, but these stories suggest that there are parts of politics where that's not happened. Have you witnessed anything? That's... I mean, I haven't, but it's... It, it, you know Parliament, it's a... It's a, it's a place that's full of hierarchy, for a start, which I think is unhealthy. Uh, where MPs are placed on a certain kind of pedestal. Mm -hmm. And that hierarchy, I think, can create unhealthy relationships uh, between MPs and staff, particularly if the MP is the sort of person that might abuse that. Um, so I think that's a problem with it. But there's another part of this that I think uh, is to be considered, is when the public are hearing all of this, the danger is that they conclude that everybody who's in politics is a knave, a rogue, a bully, whatever. And actually, while everybody should be held to account for their actions, including this uh, person that you raised at the beginning, it is important that this is seen as a public service. Politics is still the arena mm -hmm. through which the country resolves its big questions. Mm -hmm. And there are some bad people in it, but there are also some very good public servants in it too. Mm -hmm. um I just want to talk a little bit about Labour's position. We've got those important local elections uh, next week. Now, if you just look at the political situation, you've got a Prime Minister who eight out of ten people think is a liar over Partygate. Uh, you've got a Conservative MP who is alleged to have been watching actual pornography inside the House of Commons chamber. You've got a cost of living crisis that is expected to reduce living standards by a faster amount than any time in history, in the record, since we have records began. Shouldn't you be absolutely pummeling the Conservatives in the polls? Why, why aren't you cutting three more? Well, look, I think we're making progress. Uh, you're right about all those things. But the context for the start of this is the worst election result that we had for... This is two years. You can't years. keep blaming two Jeremy years. Corbyn. It was well, look, two years I, ago. I, I, know I, Jer I know Keir Starmer loves to differentiate himself against Jeremy Corbyn, but at some point, surely, well, let you've me got to start you, focusing Let me on give you another people. example from history then. I mean... I was involved in the New Labour rebuilding uh, in the 1990s uh, and the, the work that uh, New Labour did building and the work that Neil Kinnock and John Smith had done took a long, long time. We're trying to do that task in a four-year period. So in that two years plus since that worst election uh, result since 1935, we've made great progress. Um, we got a new shadow cabinet team in place. We are campaigning hard on the cost of living. We are ahead in the polls, but of course, I agree with you. After a result like that, after such an emphatic rejection, you have to work very hard to regain public trust. No, and no that's Kinnick what we're all focused on. No, Kinnock didn't win, did he? No, but I don't think that the achievements of New Labour would have happened without the efforts that he put in. Okay. Everybody's standing on the shoulders of who came before them. We made progress under Neil So Kinnock. it's Keir Starmer and Neil Kinnock, you think? No, but I think he's got a task of rebuilding that took longer in the past. Okay. He's trying to concertina that into four years. Uh, so I think he's made really good progress. But he, if he was sitting here, would agree with me that, of course, we've got a lot more to do. OK, thank you very much. Uh, Pat McFadden uh, there. You are watching The Take. We are live in Westminster. Up next, we're going to hear our question of the week, where we give a backbencher a chance to respond to the Prime Minister.
I love my job because I get to do something that is contributing to a better future. Hello, welcome back live to Westminster. You're watching The Take. Now, the political highlights of midweek, at least if you're a bit of a geek like me, Prime Minister's questions when the PM faces party leaders and backbenchers from all sides. Here's what our political correspondent, Joe Pike, made of it in PMQ's Unwrapped. Today's Prime Minister's questions was not about answers. Mr Speaker, it sounds like the comical alley of the cost of living crisis. <laughs> that would not have happened, Mr Speaker, if we'd listened uh, to Captain Hindsight. This must be the Oxford Union debating skills we've been hearing so much about. Everywhere you look, a Labour administration, it is a bankrupt shambles. <laughs> At the final parliamentary fracas before the local elections, party leaders each made their last-ditch pitch, with Labour and the SNP repeating their core campaign messages on the cost of living crisis. A vote for Labour next week is a vote for a very different set of persons. Instead of convening a Tory talking shop at Cabinet, the Prime Minister should be acting to help those children and help families through the cost of living emergency. In contrast, Boris Johnson focused on attacking Labour's own record in local and national government. Never forget Labour run Britain in 2010, bankrupt because of what the Labour government did. This guy is doomed to be a permanent spectator, Mr Speaker, because they, they, have, they have no... We have a plan to fix the NHS and fix social care. They have no plan. Now, if we look at the language Keir Starmer used today, he was shamelessly repeating his line that Labour is the party of working people. And at the bottom, you can see tax and cost of living featured a lot too. The words Boris Johnson used the most were people, uh, followed by Labour, a sure sign of his uh, strategy, his approach, that he believes one of the best forms of defence is to go on the attack. As today's session started, news broke that Conservative whips are investigating claims one of their own MPs was spotted watching pornography in the Commons chamber. It feeds into a wider debate about changing the culture within the walls of Westminster, especially after the controversial Angela Rayner leg-crossing claims in the Mail on Sunday, the source of which was a Tory MP. I know the Prime Minister will have whipped his backbenchers to scream and shout, yeah. and that's fine. Yeah. That's fine. Yeah. But I hope, I hope he's also sent a clear message that there's no place for sexism and misogyny. I uh, exchanged... Uh, messages with the Right Honourable Lady over the weekend, and I, I repeat what I said to her, there could be absolutely no place uh, for such uh, behaviour. It was striking that today Keir Starmer was flanked by women, whilst Boris Johnson was surrounded by men. Labour sources suggest that was by accident rather than design. But allegations of sleaze in politics seem unlikely to go away. 56 members of this House are under investigation for sexual misconduct, and that includes three of his Cabinet Ministers. So can he now confirm whether he considers that sexual harassment, apparently unlike bullying and lying, is grounds for dismissal under the Ministerial Code? Of course it's grounds for, uh, for dismissal. That was the final Prime Minister's questions for three weeks. It'll be back after the local elections and the Queen's speech and the fortunes of all the parties and their leaders may well have changed by then. What well, a pretty lively Prime Minister's questions, as you would expect, uh, this close to a local uh, election. So let's find out what everyone watching on Sky News uh, made of it all. Uh, our panel is back. Hello to everyone. Uh, first, can we just get a quick show of hands? If you think Boris Johnson won that Prime Minister's question session, put your hand up now. Who thought Boris Johnson came out best? One, two, th two hands up, I think. Three hands up. Uh, and if you thought Keir Starmer win, won that session, put your hand up now. Who you thought Keir Starmer won? One, two, three, four. Oh, he's just squeaked it there. Four versus three, according to our uh, viewers uh, panel. Uh, let's talk to uh, Belinda, uh, shall we? This is Belinda uh, Campbell. You've described yourself as a swing voter, uh, Belinda, uh, don't you? 
First of all, I've got to ask about the burning question of the day. The MP caught watching porn, uh, allegedly, in the chamber. How troubled are you by this story? I think that's taking a real risk. Everybody knows in every workplace, in the contracts you read, you never do things like that, you know, whether you get dismissed or get a warning before you get dismissed. Everybody knows you don't do that. And I wonder whether he was being insulting to the person or the people sitting next door to him or getting some attention in some way, um, having a dig. It, it definitely is taking a risk. So it doesn't seem a very intelligent thing to do. And obviously it's insulting. Yeah, not very intelligent. It's probably a bit of an understatement there, isn't it? Uh, we can talk now to uh, Vic Daniels. You're a Conservative supporter, aren't you, uh, Vic? Although you say that you might not vote for them next time, which I think is quite interesting. But just quickly, why, why might you not vote for them next time? Well, the party that I voted for since 1979 didn't exist anymore. Um, you know, we were never a party that believed in in tax. And as Keir Starmer said, you know, we've now had 15 tax rights. So um, the party that I grew up with and voted for ever since Maggie Thatcher was um, became Prime Minister, um, as I say, no longer exists. And what's your take on the Porngate story? Uh, is it something that bothers you? Well, you know, look, I've got here the seven principles of public life, right? Self selflessness, integrity, objectivity, accountability, openness, honesty and leadership, right? I struggle to work out, uh, how, you know, how allegedly watching porn in the House of Commons chamber actually fits in with that. Yeah, that's definitely fair enough. Right, let's go to Pradeep, shall we? This is Pradeep Sakatharan. Uh, Pradeep, let's uh, ask you about this uh, pornography story. People have been pretty scathing so far. Um, do you think it's a storm in the teacup or do you think it's pretty serious that someone was doing this? I think it's very serious. Um, I think it's disgusting. I do believe the individual needs some kind of therapy. There might be underlying issues there. I do believe the individual should be kicked out of Parliament and his party and also identified. And if you identify these individuals, it becomes a deterrent. I'm not sure why we should have a deterrent to do these things, but it does become a deterrent. Um, and we really should have a long, hard look at ourselves because we're setting an example for the next generation. And no wonder the younger generation are disconnected and disillusioned with politics nowadays. Our guests today have said that whoever was caught watching it should resign. If you think that they should be kicked out of Parliament for watching porn on their phone, put your hand up now. If they should be kicked out of Parliament. That looks like the majority to me, doesn't it? The vast majority. Uh, thanks very much, nearly everyone there. Uh, Stella, I think you were the only person there, Stella Finley, who didn't put your hand up. No, I didn't put my hand up. Um, I don't think you should be kicked out of Parliament. Um, one thing is, um, we're assuming that it was a, a man who was watching the porn. Do we actually know that? So I think I think we I'm do know sure. that. Although you are, you, we, I think you are right. People would normally assume it was a man, but I, I, my understanding is that, according to the MPs, it was a man. Yeah. Okay. Um, I think there should be some disciplinary measures, um, and I think the issue isn't so much with the watching porn. I think it's using a mechanical device in Parliament. Um, this is a chamber where people are supposed to be legislating and leading the country. And for anyone to be watching anything on a, a, a device like that, I think is wrong. So it, it, I don't think for me, the big issue is that he was watching porn. He or she was watching porn. I think it's that they were using some device and that their mind was taken away from the issues that were good, happening in the chamber. It's a good point, isn't it? You can't really be listening very well if you're, if you're looking at watching videos on your mobile phone. Uh, thank you very much for a really lively panel this week. It's been fascinating to talk to you. Uh, this is one of my favourite bits of the show, so it's always good to get your views. Now, it's our regular chance to uh, speak to an MP as we pick our Prime Minister's question of the week. Now, that's the one that really caught our eye during the session earlier, and today... It's this one. Today, a court has found that the government acted unlawfully when its policies led to the discharge of untested patients yep. from hospitals to care homes at the start of the pandemic. The court also found no evidence that the former health secretary addressed the issue of the risk to care home residents of such transmission, despite the government insisting at the time that a protective ring had been thrown around care homes. The government has once again been found 
to have broken the law. Yep. Will the Prime Minister apologise to the families of the thousands and thousands of people yep. who died in care homes in the first half of 2020? And will he also apologise to care workers for the shameful comment that he made in July 2020 when he said that too many care homes didn't follow procedures in the way that they could have? Yeah. 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 Uh, Daisy Cooper there. If you just saw me lunging out of shot, it was because I was just grabbing my... Uh, questions for our next uh, guest. Uh, of course, the questioner doesn't usually get a chance to respond uh, to the Prime Minister's answer, but this is a part of the show where we try and put that right, and each week let an MP do just that. Now, the question we heard was from Daisy Cooper, the Lib Dem, uh, asking about the ruling from the High Court today that said the government acted unlawfully by discharging untested patients to care homes during the pandemic. And can speak to Daisy now. So, Daisy, what did you make of the uh, Prime Minister's response to you? Well, it was very disappointing because the Prime Minister claimed that the government uh, didn't know enough about uh, asymptomatic um, uh, transmission of COVID, and that's simply not correct. The whole point of the court finding today was that it was precisely because the government did know that asymptomatic transmission was happening and didn't do anything about it for several weeks. And that's precisely the reason why the government was found to have acted unlawfully. Uh, now, the Prime Minister also asked where your leader, Ed Davey, was uh, in the House of Commons today. Now, he actually tweeted uh, to say, uh, Hi, Boris Johnson. Uh, I'm out talking with farmers in Winchester today. A lot say they'll never vote Conservative again. Certainly a better use of my time than listening to more of your lies. So, And he's included a picture of himself there in front of a very colourful uh, field. The fact that Ed Davey is out effectively campaigning for the local elections, is that a sign that you're a bit worried about how they're going to go? No, quite the opposite. Um, we know that we are uh, fighting really hard in a number of places across the country in these local elections to win seats off the Conservatives. Uh, Ed Davey was in Winchester uh, with uh, a farmer who's one of the top farmers in the country who has just decided to join the Liberal Democrats on the basis that we are now the voice of farmers uh, in the UK. Uh, and so actually we are looking forward to some good results uh, next week. So what would good l results look like? Because let's be honest, uh, you know, we, we've heard this before. You know, I remember, like, you know, talking to people like Joe Swinson before elections and then being, Lib Dems being very disappointed with the results. What would a good night be for the Lib Dems? Well, it's very hard to put a number on it. Um, and Liberal Democrats never take any vote uh, for granted. So we will be working incredibly hard. But really what we're hoping to see are some gains in our blue wall areas. So uh, in my seat uh, of St Albans, which also includes Harpenden, uh, is in South Cambridgeshire, in uh, Wimbledon, in South London. There's a number of places where the Liberal Democrats are the key challengers to the Conservatives and we're hoping to make gains. Now, this question might sound a bit flippant, but I actually don't mean it to be, because I think it is a question that voters will be asking ahead of the local elections. You know, what is the point of the Lib Dems? Well, the fact is that uh, Liberal Democrats um, are internationalists. We're environmentalists. We are pro-business. We're pro-public service. And I think what we've seen over the years is that there are many people who share our values and they feel that we share their values and they share ours. And we saw in both Chesham and Amersham uh, and in North Shropshire, in those two areas that have been traditionally true blue areas for hundreds of years, several people realised that they shared our values and recognised that we work incredibly hard to win their support, their trust and their votes. And they decided that we were better representatives of them and their communities. And now I just want to talk to you about a story that we've been discussing a lot on the programme uh, today, and that is sexism, you know, in Westminster. You know, we saw the Mail on Sunday uh, story about Angela Rayner crossing and crossing her legs uh, while sitting down, shockingly. Uh, the number of uh, complaints there have been about uh, allegations of sexual harassment in Westminster. And now, of course, uh, this story about a male MP watching pornography in the chamber. What's your, you're relatively new to Westminster. What's your experience of being a woman in Westminster? Is it a sexist place? Well, I think almost every single woman in Westminster, whether they're an MP or whether they're a member of staff working for an MP or on the parliamentary estates, will have either experienced or seen some form of sexism or misogyny. Uh, obviously, for me personally, for a, lot of, for a lot of the time I've been an MP, we've been working through a virtual parliament because of the pandemic. Um, but uh, certainly it's obvious that there is 
a real culture of sexism and misogyny here that we really have to tackle. I think today's news, especially about uh, an MP reportedly watching porn in the chamber, is just really disgusting, quite frankly. You know, there are good reasons why MPs might need to check their phones occasionally whilst they're in the chamber, often to check the claims that are being made at the dispatch box or to respond to urgent, urgent constituency cases that they know are, are coming in that day. But sitting and watching a porn site whilst you should be listening to a parliamentary debate is just almost incomprehensible. OK, Daisy Cooper, thank you very much for being on the programme uh, today. MP there for St Albans. You're watching The Take live in Westminster. Up next, we're going to be rounding up everything we've heard and doing a bit of post-match analysis. Dover. We track the changes happening to our world right now. I think it's a procession of the Taliban. There they are, right here. Would you as Prime Minister be able to look them in the face? Let's have a look at both of those two things. I just want to say thank you for having the courage to speak to us. We do genuinely believe in what we do, to show the truth. I thought there was an astonishing story there. Independent United Kingdom. These last few years have seen some huge stories. And these stories have been driven by politics, by politicians, the people in power. You must stay at home. And it's my job to figure out how these decisions made by politicians impact all of us in our everyday lives. This is the worst thing I've ever been through in my life. People turn up here with their child stuff in a black sack and just say, I don't want to. And that is what it is. It's, it's first class poverty. Is this an example of the welfare state failing? We take you to the heart of the stories that shape our world. These are stories that affect us all. Millions of children are now having to catch up. Some stories have changed all of our lives. Because like the residents, the staff are being infected. Politicians, they make decisions all of the time and it's our job to hold them to account. I wonder if you will take this opportunity to apologise to those families. But in the end, the real power doesn't actually lie with the politicians. The real power lies with the people. I'm Nick Martin. I'm the People and Politics Correspondent at Sky News. We support communities to grow food in lost and unloved spaces across the city. So our main kind of driving force is to get people growing. because I get to do something that is contributing to a better future. Hello, welcome back live to Westminster. This is The Take. Well, we've had plenty of takes this evening, so time now for a bit of post-match analysis with our Deputy Political Editor Sam Coates, who is here again. Sam, we've just heard from Daisy Cooper from the Lib Dems, uh, who wouldn't say what a good night was, but she was confident of taking lots of seats off Boris Johnson. Uh, what would a good night be? 
Well, we can answer that question pretty directly, courtesy of Michael Thrasher, Sky's election analyst. And if the Liberal Democrats add about 50 to 100 councillors uh, next Thursday, that will be deemed to be a good night. Um, now, the number that we're really looking at will be the Tory number. If the Tories... Now, the Tories are probably going to lose, and that's going to put pressure on Boris Johnson. If they lose as many as 350 councillors, then that really is going to be a bad night. 100, 150, they might be able to put that to, um, towards mid-term blues. But really, I think people in Westminster are going to be looking at whether or not there is a read across from what happens in the country next Thursday uh, to what might happen in the future, future general election. And, of course, pressure on uh, Boris Johnson as well. How are Boris Johnson's poll numbers looking? Well, it's absolutely fascinating. Let's, uh, let's look at his poll ratings at the moment, what people think of him personally. How is Boris Johnson doing? Now, if you look at the blue line, that's people who think he's doing well. The red line, uh, that's people who think he's doing badly. And you can see, really, since pretty much this time last year, since the local elections, he's, a majority of people think that he is doing uh, badly. More people think that he is doing badly by quite a big margin than think he's doing well. This is the thing that's animating Conservative MPs, that's suggesting uh, to them that he might not be the winner uh, that he perhaps want, once was even uh, as recently as a year ago. Pretty bad trends for him. The question is, can he recover uh, his halo, given just how many don't, people don't think he uh, is doing well? But it's, it's quite clear these are bad numbers for Boris Johnson. But look at this. It's Keir Starmer's numbers. Remember that pattern that we've just seen? And it's actually quite similar when you get to Keir Starmer. So here we have the number of people that think he's doing badly. And again, more people think that Keir Starmer's doing badly than he's doing well. In and trending the wrong way as well for Keir Starmer. Absolutely. You've got, uh, perhaps around the turn of the year, some people thinking uh, Keir Starmer was doing a bit better, but then you've seen his numbers, uh, according to YouGov, tail off once again. Um, and I think that this is one of the things that's... Uh, uh, causing pause for thought amongst particularly Tory MPs who, after the local election, are going to start thinking about whether or not they want to keep Boris Johnson in the light of Partygate in the light of what seems, I think, to them like endless troubles. Perhaps Boris Johnson is less popular than he once was, but who can beat Keir Starmer and is he actually beatable given his personal ratings? aren't so good as perhaps uh, some of the polls suggest. People do think that Keir Starmer's marginally more competent, that's the red line uh, here, than, uh, than, than Boris Johnson. But actually, when you look at key metrics like competence, what strikes me is just how similar people think they are. So perhaps nice. Keir Starmer might just be seen as beatable still by Tory MPs. Uh, fascinating uh, stuff, as always. Uh, always enjoy the analysis. Thank you very much, Sam. Coates. Now, we do have a bit of breaking news in the last few minutes before we go because we've just had this from the Conservative Chief Whip looking, of course, into uh, those pornography uh, allegations. Following allegations of inappropriate behaviour in the House of Commons, the Chief Whip has asked that this matter be referred to the ICGS, that's Parliament's watchdog. Upon the conclusion of any ICGS investigation, the Chief Whip will take appropriate action. Appropriate action. What is that going to be? Certainly, uh, the MPs uh, on the take tonight thought that it was something that the person should be kicked out of Parliament for. Well, uh, busy show today. Our Sunday show is a bit of an election uh, special this week as well. That's Sophie Ridge on Sunday. We'll be hearing from the Labour leader, Sir Keir Starmer, the SNP leader and Scottish First Minister, Nicola Sturgeon, plus the leaders of the Lib Dems, Greeds and Plaid Cymru, plus the Conservatives, of course. It's a busy one. <laughs> See you then.
bama dale komase ligay bi yoku yoku te bu bari am nañ ko ci Con eso ya podemos ir evaluando entonces cómo el cambio climático va a afectar estos ecosistemas y eso cómo afecta prácticamente toda la cadena. O sea, si afectamos a los productores primarios, que son las microalgas, vamos a ver afectado obviamente todo el resto de los organismos. Sí.